All right, Psalm 31. Psalm 31. You know, normally when we uh, look at these psalms, I try to pinpoint, you know, what is the main idea of the psalm? What is the main emphasis? Because there are times, there, you know, the psalms being an expression to God, a lot of times prayer to God, talking to God somehow, or it could be a psalm of praise. And so you, you, it's good to just to try to pinpoint, even though there's a, maybe different subjects that are addressed in a psalm, what is the main Focus. What is the, maybe the first thing on the heart of the psalmist? And in this case, Psalm 31 is really a psalm of David's declaration of trust, trusting in the Lord. Let's take a look at that. Let's read the first verse. Psalm 31 and verse 1 says, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed, deliver me in thy righteousness. So the first part, in thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Contrast that with in Psalm 30, says, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up, and I hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. So that is, extolling would be a, a psalm of exaltation, lifting up the Lord. And, uh, and so there's psalms of praise, psalms of crying out to God in his despair and trials, and then this one does include uh, addressing some of his trials, but the main focus is his declaration of trusting in the Lord. And uh, we'll see that actually this psalm is, is bookended by that, that thought, that theme, uh, as we go along here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and these wonderful psalms that we can take uh, great uh, help from, comfort in, and, and strength and edification. Lord, help us to... Uh, allow you to speak to us through your word tonight. May you meet the need of every heart and touch each life. In Jesus' name, amen. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. One of the most crucial aspects of the Christian life, one of the most crucial areas, I guess, of the Christian life that is, is necessary for us to be able to go forward in the Christian life and to see God work in a mighty way and, and for God to either use us, to change us, to be glorified through us, is how much we trust Him. That is really one of the keys. If, think about from a human standpoint. How much of a relationship, I'm sorry, how much of a hindrance is there in relationships or in a family, in a marriage, in a church, uh, in a place of employment? Uh, how much of a hindrance is it to the success or the vitality of those things, those relationships, those areas, if there is a lack of trust on one side or another or both sides? Uh, that hinders a lot of things. A lack of trust hinders a lot of things. And uh, if, you, if there's not trust, I even think about, uh, maybe you can even extend that to sports teams where players need to trust each other and they that that brings them together in cohesion and unity where they can go forward and have success because they trust each other they're relying on each other and they have success when there's uh, strife and contention and uh, hard feelings something's just not right between teammates that can hinder the entire team's success and so in many areas of life all kinds of areas of life the issue of trust is uh, just a, a vitally important one. This, this message tonight is not so much about trust between people. This is our relationship with God, our walk with God, and how much we trust Him. The more we trust in the Lord, uh, the, the better decisions we'll make. The more we trust in the Lord, the more we'll be in a position to see Him work in and do just great and mighty things. Uh, because if we don't trust Him, that will that does affect decision making that defect and that affects you know what i need to take a certain issue maybe a, a trial comes maybe a challenge comes maybe a, an important decision comes down the line and we are tempted i need to take this into my hands because maybe there's a lack of trust in the lord to give us wisdom or to work things out according to his will and so this declaration of trust is very important in thee o lord do i put my trust let me never be ashamed. Deliver me 
in thy righteousness. So we're going to look at a few things here in, in the way that David was trusting the Lord. So first there's the declaration of trust, but then he trusts God for deliverance. David trusted God for deliverance. We've covered this in other Psalms where he's asking God, he's crying out to God for deliverance from his enemies and through his trials and afflictions. He's asking God for help. So this is nothing new. But here he is, he's trusting in God for his deliverance. He says, deliver me in thy righteousness. Verse 2, bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me. One of the great things about the Psalms is some of the language that is used. And some of my favorite language in the Psalms is when there's the comparison to God being a rock or a fortress. Uh, here it says, uh, be thou my strong rock, or here it says, a house of defense. So uh, picture a castle, picture a strong area, picture a heavily guarded place, uh, a well-fortified place. And, and that is the picture, that's what David was picturing uh, and what he was comparing God to, that that's who God is to him. He's saying, would you be this for me? Would you function as this for me? And that's just a great picture. He says in verse 3, For thou art my rock and my fortress. So that, that picture there again, the rock and the fortress. Uh, and we'll come back to the rest of the verse 3, but look at verse 4. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me, for thou art my strength. So he's recognizing who God is, who God is to him, especially you're my strength, you're my rock, you're my fortress. Uh, would you be a house of defense to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. He's recognizing who God is. He is trusting in God as his rock and his fortress. And so as a result, he's, he, he recognizes God has the ability to pull him out of the net that they have laid privily for me, that they have, that they have laid. There are people after me. There are people who are setting traps for me. There are these pitfalls, these traps in life, and uh, David is trusting God for deliverance because he recognizes who God is. He's his rock and his fortress. And then uh, he trusts God for guidance in verse 3. He says, therefore, the end of verse 3, therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. So because God was his rock and his fortress, he says, and for, my, for thy name's sake. And that needs to be the, the attitude of our, our hearts is that when we recognize that God is our rock and our fortress, then our motivation should not be God to do things for our sake, but for God to do, first and foremost, do things for His name's sake, because it is His name that's at stake. If we have a declaration, if we're, if we're declaring our trust and our belief in the Lord, then, and, and other people know that especially, and we have that testimony, oh, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, then God's name is the one that's at stake when we need His help. It's not just simply us that's, that's at stake, our situations in life that, that are at stake. Uh, it's not our own comfort or safety or uh, provision, whatever it is that's at stake. It's God's name is at stake because then he is, um, He's putting Himself out there. Uh, if, he, if He doesn't come through, that's a bad testimony, not... For us, that's a bad testimony for the Lord. And so that does, uh, it should not be said that we then we just expect things of God or demand of Him to uh, meet our every whim. We should not ask according to the lusts of our flesh. So we need to be asking according to His will. But David was close enough with the Lord. He had God's mind on the matter of things. And, and so he would ask according to His will. He's just asking for protection. He's asking for safety. Lord, would you see me through this? Would you deliver me from those that are against me. So it's for thy name's sake. And if we recognize that things are for more for God's sake rather than our sakes, then that shifts our attention. It shifts it away from us and shifts it more onto what is going to give God more glory. And then we can trust him for guidance. He says, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. You know, I need your leadership. I need your guidance for your name's sake, because you know, I'm, I'm here with this testimony of trusting you. And so if, if, if I don't go the right way, uh, if I don't have your guidance on things, that's, you know, it's for your name's sake that I want that. I want you to have glory. Uh, in verse, um, verse 5, we see that he's trusting God with his whole being. Now in this, we get some really um, 
things that go a whole lot deeper than just simply being in a temporal problem of, of having people after him. In verse 5 he says, Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Now does that language sound kind of familiar to anybody? Uh, it sounds like what Jesus said on the cross, doesn't it? Now last week we looked at Psalm 22 and the great prophetic uh, psalm there of, of Christ and his death on the cross. But here uh, he says, Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Once again, uh, a picture of uh, uh, Jesus Christ repeating almost those exact words on the cross. But he's trusting God not just to get him out of this jam, not just to get him through this adversity, but he says, I, commend, I commit my spirit to you. The whole, I mean, all of me, my whole being, the very innermost part of my being, I commit that to you. That's a big step. That's a big step of trust. He trusted God with his whole being. He says, Thou hast redeemed me, O God of truth. Now, once again, another very important word regarding salvation. Now, when uh, the, the first part involves salvation in the sense that when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are committing our spirit to God. We now belong to Him. We're His child. He, his spirit comes to dwell in us, and so His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so then another word here that involves salvation is redeemed. Redeemed. What is redeemed? Uh, that means we are purchased. Purchased possession. Now hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Now at this point, you know, Christ hadn't died on the cross. So some of the language that David uses in some of his psalms, I mean, you'd think it's straight out of the New Testament. That's just, that's the great prophetic implications of these, of these psalms here. And uh, so when he's using that word redeemed, he's, thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. He is trusting God with his whole being because he's recognizing what God has done for him. And we should be able, based on what Jesus Christ has done for us in his death on the cross, his paying for our sins, his great salvation that he provides, we then should be able to trust God with all of our being. You know, when a person gets saved, that's really what they're doing. They're trusting God with their innermost core part of their being that I trust God enough that I believe he can and will save me that He is the one who has the power to save me. That's a big step of trust. That's a big step of faith. And so trusting God, then as, as we, uh, when we trust Christ as our Savior, then as we go along in life, you know, we've trusted Him to save us, then why would it be hard for us to trust Him in the temporal circumstances of life? Doesn't it seem like maybe it gets out of balance where, oh yeah, I'll trust God to save me. I'll trust Him to take me for, to heaven and save me from my sins. But uh, at the same time, you know, this decision here on earth, I need to take that into my hands. It doesn't make sense. But you know what? I think there's probably many Christians who do that all the time. Oh, they know they're saved. They know that, yeah, my sins are covered by the blood. I'm saved. Uh, but then it's hard to trust God for financial provision. It's hard to trust God for uh, healing or some sort of health condition, health situation. It's hard to trust God for uh, maybe a uh, restoring of a relationship or a changed life or someone to repent or uh, of, of some uh, situation in their lives. You know, all those things, it's harder to trust God, yet we trust Him enough to save us. So we should be able to trust Him as we go along in other areas of our lives. So we just trust Him with our whole being. Verse, down in verse 15, I love this as well. My times are in thy hand. So he's basically, he's right. my life, the time I have on earth, my days, my months, my years, they're in your hand. I'm trusting you with my whole being. You know, we have a society, a culture now that is uh, people are petrified. They're fearful of what's going to happen to my health. And so, I mean, people just pour money, I mean, money after, you know, dollar after dollar into all kinds of things just to try to salvage their health. Now, there's times where we need, you know, we need nutrients, we need uh, nutrition, we need maybe there's certain supplements that there is, there are reasons for why we might take some things that, that God has provided for our health. But, but it's not so much what we do, it is the attitude people have. Not everyone has the same attitude. So some people have the attitude, it's just, they are just doing everything they can 
to have good health and to, to feel good. And, and by the way, I, in some ways you can understand it where, you know, maybe people went through a lot of their lives just not feeling good and they finally came upon some answers that, you know what, uh, wow, I feel really good after, you know, getting fit, losing some weight, eat, eating better. I don't blame people at all for being excited and, uh, and, and, you know, really getting into that. But what happens is for, for some people, and I hope this isn't so much for Christians, but uh, especially for people who don't know the Lord, what else do they have to turn to? And that's why there's this big, there's, there is a big push for, you know what, we just need to try to extend our life, extend our life. And I'm, I'm thankful for a long life. I'm thankful when God gives people long lives. And, you know, but we should have the attitude of David. My times are in thy hand. And so that, yes, we need to be responsible with the bodies, with the lives God has given us, not be careless, not have an I don't care attitude, but at the same time recognize, you know, God is the one who decides when our time on earth is up. And then here he, at the end of verse 15, he says, uh, in the middle of verse 15, he, he, he does give a request. My times are in thy hand. De deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. So he's recognizing, God, my times are in your hand, so please deliver me. <laughs> You have the power to do this. You can do this. Deliver me from their hands. He's trusting God with his whole being. Then we see a, a more lengthy section here. Trusting God in adversity. In uh, uh, verse 6, go back to verse 6. I have hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble. Thou hast known my soul in adversities. And hast not shut me up into the hand of the enemy, though hast set my feet in a large room. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble, mine eyes consumed with grief, yea, my soul and my belly. For my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity, and my bones are consumed. I was a reproach among all mine enemies, but especially among my neighbors and a fear to mine acquaintance. They that did see me without fled from me. You know, one of the things also that you find here in in the Psalms is that here David then makes a reference. He says, my strength faileth because of mine iniquity. So he's not just asking for deliverance and, and, and help in his adversity. He's not just trusting God through his adversity that is caused by other people, but he's also asking God for mercy and deliverance from his lack of strength and his trials because of his own iniquity. He recognized his own faults, his own failures and sins in his life. Now, the great uh, uh, psalm of, if you want to say, repentance and confession is Psalm 51. That's the greatest one we have from him when he is asking for God's mercy after his uh, sin, his, his, his adultery with Bathsheba. And uh, when he was found out and he, the finger was pointed at him, thou art the man, and he, he had a repentant heart about that. But here he does make a reference also to mine iniquity, my bones are consumed, and, uh, and then he says, I am forgotten as a dead man. Verse 12, I am forgotten as a dead man out of mine. I am like a broken vessel, for I have heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they devised to take away my life. Now, slander is not a good thing. But David here apparently experienced slander. What is slander? Well, it's a, uh, it is a it's character assassination. It's telling, it's, it's bad-mouthing somebody for the purpose of hurting them. It is, or even one person has said, it's telling the truth with the design to hurt. So even the things that were said about David could have been true. You know, perhaps there's some of his sins, some of his uh, downfalls, and uh, some, of them could, some of the things that said could be lies. Slander can be truth or lies. It's just some things that are said with a purpose, with a design to hurt. Well, oftentimes, slander is actually true. Uh, it's, just, uh, it's, it's just said with the wrong purpose reason, wrong motivation, and oftentimes should not be repeated at all uh, by the slanderer. But he's trusting God in this adversity. He says in verse 14, uh, But I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my God. So he's, he's, re, he's, he's recounting some things in the past. He's recounting what he's already been through. And so he's, but he's not letting that get him down. He says, But I trusted in thee. O Lord, I said, thou art my God. And so he says, no matter what. Now, why was it that David, 
even with his sins in his life, you know, very glaring sins in his life. Uh, things we'd look at and say, wow, this, this person, he's, he's not very good. Adultery, murder. And, you know, what, uh, what, what made it so that God would have such favor upon David? Why not do that for Saul? Why not do that for others? Because David's heart was different. He had a heart that was toward the Lord, that it was soft toward the Lord, that wanted to be right with God. Saul did not have that. Saul was concerned about his own legacy, his own image, his own power. Uh, and God did, wasn't impressed with that. And he did give Saul some chance. I mean, he did give Saul some little chances here and there. But, uh, but you know, it didn't take long. God handled... Uh, or, or took Saul's disobedience very seriously when you just flat out disobey the word of the Lord. There's a difference between when someone's just flat out disobeying the word of the Lord and when someone has the right desires. And you know what? Even people that have the right desires still sin. People that have the right desires still face trials and slander and these types of things. But why did God show mercy to David? Because David, first of all, David was a man after God's own heart. He was someone who was humble, or when he was prideful, he did get humbled. And uh, he was someone who had a desire to be right with God, and he had a deep abiding trust in the Lord. And so there were qualities in David's life that God had favor upon. And that brings me to uh, the next one is trusting God. He was trusting God for his favor and also justice. Verse 16, might make thy face to shine upon thy servant, save me for thy mercy's sake. So he's trusting God for his favor, for his mercy. You know, the fact is, if God shows mercy towards someone, he is showing them favor. God doesn't have to show mercy. Let me not be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon thee. Let the wicked be ashamed and let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee. Interesting. Uh, you ever stockpile anything? You ever save up some extra food? Uh, we've, we're, we're finally getting down, uh, getting our quantities down, but we had a, you know, seemed like a half a cupboard full of salad dressing for a few months. And why was that? Because it seemed like, you know, every time it was on sale, you know what, we'll get more salad dressing. Or then there was a lower price at Aldi on some, we get some of the salad dressing from them and they had just this insanely low price. Thought, we don't know how low the price is going to be, so let's just get stock up on salad dressing. And so we are getting through it. We are getting through it. I, you know, looked at it today and, um, you know, so we're, we're getting down there. But, uh, you know, I think at one point we had, what, you know, four or five containers just of Caesar, you know. And, uh, you know, we think we still have three French left, three French hens, two turtle doves. No, um, you know, three French. So we each had different favorites of salad dressing. And, uh, you know, that's, th that was laid aside. That was salad dressing laid aside for a future use. But notice that God's goodness is, it says, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee. So there we see a hint as to who God has special favor, special uh, goodness reserved is for those who fear the Lord. David had a healthy fear of God, and God certainly bestowed some goodness and favor upon him. It says, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. And so those that are just publicly, they're unashamed of the Lord, to just walk with the Lord, humbly walking with God, God has some special blessings laid up just for them. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he hath showed me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. O love the Lord, all ye his saints. For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Now, uh, the proud doer is, uh, you know, the plentif plentiful reward for the proud doer uh, is, is not the good kind of reward. Uh, that's the justice that he gets. And God has certain things laid up for the proud, proud as well. Uh, and those that do not fear the Lord. 
And so he's asking, he's trusting God for both favor and, and along with that mercy and justice, justice to be done against the evildoers and then also his mercy and favor upon him based on his fear of the Lord and his trusting the Lord. And then finally, let's see what the last verse here, how this ties in with verse 1. And we don't see the uh, word trust in, the, in verse 24, but it says, Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. And trusting the Lord brings courage. The, the more you trust the Lord, the more courage you'll have to live the Christian life. Courage means bravery. It is that quality of mind which enables men to encounter danger and difficulties with firmness or without fear or depression of spirits. And, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing more paralyzing than discouragement. Discouragement is a lack of courage. It's a lack of boldness or bravery to go forward. And, and notice when he says here, the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, without fear or depression of spirits. So when you, are, when you have courage, I mean, your spirit is lifted up and you just feel like going forward that you can do anything, that you can conquer anything, you can accomplish anything. When you get discouraged, it causes you to fear and doubt, or along with it comes fear and doubt, and then we don't accomplish as much. We don't go forward as much because we are discouraged. But trusting the Lord brings courage. It's be of good courage. It says be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. When you decide you're going to trust the Lord and you have courage, you have bravery, then God gives the strength to honor. He honors that courage by strengthening your heart. You, it actually, the, the presence of courage results in more strength and more courage. And that's why the devil, one of the devil's greatest weapons is discouragement. The devil loves it when God's people get discouraged. And I'd say pretty much just at least all the adults here um, have visited, hopefully not resided too long in times of discouragement. How much did you, how much do you accomplish when you're discouraged? How much, uh, how much do you just feel like, you know what, I'm trusting the Lord so much uh, in times of discouragement? Well, no, if we were actually trusting the Lord, we wouldn't be discouraged. <laughs> the two don't go together. So I'm not, I'm not knocking anybody. We've all, vis we've all been there. So I'm not necessarily knocking anybody for being discouraged. It does happen. It does become a part of life. But we've got to be careful because when people live in discouragement, they, they visit discouragement for too long, then it turns into what we call, in a clinical sense, depression. You know, what, what the you know, psychological... Uh, uh, terms would be, and would be more discouragement than leads to depression if it's not, if a person doesn't come out of that discouragement. And uh, then once a person's in depression, then it's harder even to climb out of that, which is why we need to recognize the discouragement when it comes, and what should our response be? It should be, be of good courage, because trust the Lord, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen your heart. You know, your heart fails when you're discouraged, but when you have courage, your heart is strengthened for the task ahead. And it says, all ye that hope in the Lord. What is hope? That is confidence, an expectation of the Lord's goodness, the Lord's blessing of uh, just that the Lord will do based on, uh, do things based on who he is. And, and uh, so when we hope in the Lord, we have a confidence in the Lord. That's a trust in the Lord. And so that's really the, the main theme that to me runs through this psalm is, is David's trust in the Lord. He starts with the declaration of trust, but then, you know, then it's, it's great when he addresses others. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. So there's the message outward. He's not just talking upward. He's, he's, he's speaking outward. You know what? We have it today. God inspired that for a reason. So he's not, he's not just speaking. He wasn't just writing outwardly to those at that time who would read it. You know what? He's, he's still speaking to us today through the written word. We still have him speaking to us today. God speaking through David. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. So I don't know. Uh, maybe there's someone dis, uh, visiting uh, discouragement visiting visiting the uh, the room or the house of discouragement and uh, what's the answer we need to look to the Lord 
We need to trust in Him. That will build up our courage. We can have courage then based on who God is and His ability to deliver, His ability to help. And we can go forward with confidence and hope in the Lord. We can be and, and with bravery, uh, which is that uh, courage. Or if you're not, if you're not discouraged right now, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you're really on, just on top of it, on top of the world. And um, although if you're on top of the world, be careful because you can fall. Uh, but maybe, maybe, maybe you're not discouraged. Let's put it that way. Put it simply. Maybe you're not discouraged right now. Maybe circumstances are pretty good. There's no circumstances that are leading you to discouragement. There are times that discouragement comes based on what an, an anticipated future event or what will or will not happen. It's not always even what is the here and now. Sometimes it's looking ahead to the future and just doubting whether or not things are going to work out. Because discouragement can even come from that. So whether or not you're discouraged right now, maybe you're not discouraged right now, you're probably going to need it sometime, need this psalm someday. Or you, if you're not discouraged now, you probably already have been discouraged in the past. And you need this psalm. But especially for the future, when we find ourselves visiting discouragement, let's remember Psalm 31 and the declaration of trust in the Lord, and recognizing that God can strengthen our hearts, but we need to have courage and we need to hope in the Lord.